Uh, in my younger days, I kept two sayings tacked up on my office wall. The composer Igor Stravinsky's saying, a masterpiece is all that counts. And the Roman writer Pliny the Elder saying, nulla dia sine linea, never a day without a line. Now, I've always been fond of quotes, uh, the sort of thing that nowadays appears on memes all over social media. And, uh, you know, Pliny would have been a, a big hit on Twitter. He wrote some serious lines, uh, less than 280 characters in his day, in addition to never a day without a line. He wrote, cum grano salis, with a grain of salt. In vino veritas, in wine there is truth. Fortes fortuna iovat, fortune favors the brave. And uh, the slightly longer phrase, malum quidum nullum esse sine aliquo bono. There's no bad thing that doesn't bring some good. And it's even uh, debated uh, whether or not uh, he was able to write something like ubi domus ibi cor. Um, home is where the heart is. Well, I still practice nulla dia sine linea. I've managed to write something almost every day for the last 40 or some odd years, uh, including days when I was flat on my back in the hospital. But I won't be retweeting Stravinsky's saying about a masterpiece being all that counts. As a matter of fact, nowadays I positively and totally disagree with his idea. I don't think a matter masterpiece matters much in all of how we live a well-lived life. Nowadays, I would retweet something maybe by the Spanish philosopher Jose Ortega y Gasset, who wrote, being an artist means ceasing to take seriously that very serious person we are when we're not an artist. Or maybe better, the, the little shorter, Louise Erdrich's Erdich uh, incisive comment, I think, you are the book you are writing. Um, because, to be honest, following Stravinsky's very serious insistence upon high art as the very essence of life, um, it made me a little bit of a jerk, I'm, I'm afraid, or maybe a whole lot of a jerk. And eventually, I didn't like that guy very much, and uh, lots of things uh, matter more, I realize now, than doing that masterpiece. Uh, a lot of that being a jerk part had to do with my adamant drive to be something else, something I wasn't, uh, to acquire a new label. Uh, I was born with the labels of trailer trash and white trash. And uh, rather than questioning the labels I was born into, which is probably a more healthy alternative, I went looking for other kinds of labels. And consequently, for years, I was focused on how to be a poet rather than focusing on maybe how to actually write a poem. And that's just foolish because what poets are are people who write poems. It's foolish to attempt to live up to some kind of a label poet. And in time, I've learned to cease to be that very serious person who wants to achieve poet or artist or any other label. Now, that said, I don't mean to fall off uh, the other side of the rail. This is not about that uh, being not doing thing. Again, for me, it's not about product anymore, masterpiece or otherwise. It's about living and enjoying being alive in its fullness, not in the tiny stuffy rooms of single-minded achievement, achievement, achievement. Now here's another thought that might make a good tour of the Twitter sphere. The Russian writer Anton Chekhov said, if you want to work on your art, work on your life, which about sums it up, I think. Okay, working on ourselves, uh, writing that book that is the self that Louise Erdrich talks about. Uh, a lot of people are having a tough time writing the book of themselves just now. Uh, the American Psychological Association examines American stress levels every year and uh, issues a report appropriately titled and copyrighted Stress in America. And uh, here's a little bit from that report. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has altered every aspect of American life, from health and work to education and exercise. Over the long term, warns the American Psychological Association, the negative mental health effects of the coronavirus will be serious and long lasting. Now, one section of that report is titled, Government Response to COVID-19 is a significant source of stress for nearly seven in 10 Americans, end quote. The two groups most adversely affected are parents of young children and people of color. Now, the quote again, more than seven in 10 say managing distance online learning for their children is a significant source of stress, 71%. Parents are more likely than those who are not parents to say basic needs, access to food and housing are significant sources of stress, 70%. Other significant stresses for parents include access to healthcare and services, 66%, and missing major milestones such as weddings and graduation ceremonies, 63%, end quote. And uh, to all of that stress has added the stress of a sudden spike in cases yet again. I suppose it goes without saying that American stress levels, always higher than most places in the world, are now astronomical. And then we've got the holidays coming soon, as Tim sang about, that hectic mad rush in the hopes of getting to that perfect silent night. And that's what I want to think about some today. Where do we find stillness? And that's our theme for the month of December, stillness, how to get there, how to stay there as much as possible in this maelstrom that we call 2020. Well, the British romantic poet John Keats spent much of his very short life, he died in his mid-20s, consciously working at writing great poems because he had considerable success toward that goal in his few years on this planet. Many would-be poets ever since have read his letters to discover what Keats realized about writing a poem, what made his poetry so sublime when he was so young. The most famous of his poetic speculations is what Keats called negative capability, which he defined in a letter as capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Sounds like that old Buddhist teaching I talked about last week of letting go of expectations. Now, the great German poet Rainer Maria Rilke was thinking in, I think, that same direction when he wrote this in his letters to a young poet, quote, be patient toward all that is unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves. Like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek the answers which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything, live the questions now. And in another letter, uh, Rilke wrote this, it must be immense, the silence in which sounds and movements have room. And if one thinks that along with all this, the presence of the distant sea also resounds perhaps as the innermost note in this prehistoric harmony, then one can only wish that you are trustingly and patiently letting the magnificent solitude work upon you, the solitude which can no longer be erased from your life." End quote. Well, in these passages, I propose as a formula for not only writing poems, but for wise and felicitous living in general capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching. Hmm. And love the questions themselves, like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. We've all witnessed a great deal of sound and fury over these past several months, 
very loud words full of adamant conviction and a lot of irritable reaching. Yet these poets tell us that a world in which every question has an answer is a world without creativity, a world without possibility. Creativity, possibility, and I think hope as well. All of these are about living in those gray areas, I think. Living with the ambiguity, living in the questions, living not for the conclusion, but for the process. Not to be a poet, but to write a poem. That's clearly good for poets, yes. It's also good advice for everybody. I think it's a way that we can work on our daily lives. For me, that work is often, yeah, writing poems, but it doesn't have to be about writing poems for everybody. Uh, meditation, mindfulness, yoga, photography, a gratitude journal, identifying plants, birds, rocks, whatever, whatever method you need in order to stop and pause and find the stillness and realize the beauty around us. And I love the book that Allison shared with us this morning, Mindful Bee and the Worry Tree. It's a clever and succinct instruction manual on the fine art of beating anxiety through mindfulness. When practice, what practice will enable you to savor life's gifts during the season? That's what we all need to be thinking about. How do we get out of what's very likely to be even more stressful then than it is today. How can you and I avoid that irritable reaching that Keats was talking about? All of us would do well to figure it out and be ready as these days uh, become more and more unstill. You know, I've talked before about my situational depression around the holidays. Um, I talk about it because I know a lot of people uh, suffer from that kind of thing. I'm not alone in that. Ch childhood trauma, loved ones lost, the shoulda, coulda, woulda, oughtas that we face in our self-talk during holiday seasons. And my resolution for this holiday season is to stay out of my head and keep in my body. Uh, those shouldas, couldas, wouldas, and oughtas are the Buddhists will tell us merely thoughts. That's the central insight of Buddhist practice. Thoughts are not us. Thoughts are only thoughts. None of us are our thoughts, not if we don't allow our unthoughtful thoughts to run our lives. Always that background noise saying coulda, woulda, shoulda. For me, being in my body, well, okay, that's not entirely comfortable. Um, as I've discussed before, uh, we Midwestern farmers learn early to ignore pain and emotions. And in addition, I, you know, I was malnourished as a kid, so my bones didn't develop uh, all that well. And also, we hillbillies like me are inbred. So when I get out of bed in the morning nowadays, I pop and crack like an old lumber wagon, I'm afraid. Uh, carrying the scars of poverty and physical and mental scars. Uh, I so dreaded going back to school after Christmas and having all the kids asking what I got for Christmas. I didn't want to say. The holidays bring back all of that anger and all of that sadness. And if I'm not careful, I can forget to stay in my kind of decrepit body. But none of us can feel whole or even be whole if we're not in both of our, our minds and in our bodies all the time. So this season, I intend to get up on my bent old legs and be here right now in this holiday season, not living in those Christmases long, long ago, as the old song puts it. That's the only way to be whole now in this today. Now, sure, uh, I'll be looking for stillness by writing some lines in a poem and going for walks and talking with friends and family. It's not easy, but it can be done even for those of us who have our depression around the holidays. When I feel anxiety rising, I'm I intend to remember the Mindful Bee and the Worry Tree book. I remind myself to breathe and to look at that anxiety. 
Awareness of the breath is the center of all of the ancient meditative traditions. Breathing is something we have control over. We can slow it down, we can deepen it, we can calm ourselves by using some simple techniques available all over the internet and even in kids' books. Or you can email me. I've been studying these things for a very long time. And if that anxiety just won't go away, well, the ministers and members of First Unitarian Society are here for you. Contact us. Uh, that's what community is all about. Reach out to the people that you know. Ask us ministers who uh, you know, might like to get to know and have a maybe a, a conversation with. We are a community, and that means being here for each other. And we have programming coming up in this still December as well, Coffee and Wisdom every weekday morning, Humanist Bible Study on Wednesday nights. We always have uh, some talk time after those. Uh, Rev. Jim will be doing a special program for people in grief. The Seasonal Celebrations team is working on a great solstice celebration coming up. Uh, Rev. Jim will be doing a special assembly on Christmas Eve, something we don't do anymore, but eh, maybe a little tough this year. And every Sunday morning in December, we will have an assembly and consider that uh, theme we have this month, stillness. This season, may you be capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching. May you live everything, live the questions now. That's one of the central insights of Buddhism. Holding on to expectations hurts. Letting go of expectations frees, frees us up let go or be dragged, as the Buddhists say. In this often hectic season, I try to write a poem, even a bad one, or play that song, take that walk, read that book you've been meaning to, whatever it takes to find the stillness that is there in you, as Rilke said a long time ago, despite the noise of the times. And I'll end today by um, reading a poem from Rilke. This is one of his sonnets to Orpheus. It's a poem that reminds us to breathe. Quiet friend who has come so far, feel how your breathing makes more space around you. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you be the bell. As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. Move back and forth into the change. What is it like such intensity of pain? If the drink is bitter, turn yourself into wine. In this uncontainable night, be the mystery at the crossroads of your senses, the meaning discovered there. And if the world has ceased to hear you, say to the silent earth, I flow to the rushing water. Speak, I am. So may it be this season.